little scene out of a movie called March of 2020. I'm going to take you back to when we all learned how to unmute ourselves from Zoom. Uh, but what I had begun to say was that I am welcoming you all here today to our U.S. Pro Bono Summit of 2022 and how I, truly I've been waiting two and a half years to be able to share a welcome like that while looking people in the eyes, while being able to be in a room with folks, while having such an incredible array of folks online. And I want to start first by introducing myself, because I know we have so many amazing practitioners and partners and folks in this space who have been to our pro bono summits before, but also now such an incredibly expanded pool of folks joining us here today. So I am Lindsay Gruber. I'm the president and CEO of the Taproot Foundation. My pronouns are she, her. For folks in the room on your name tags, you have the option of adding your own pronouns as well. And online, you can share as you introduce yourselves. I have had the honor and pleasure of being Taproot CEO since the summer of 2018. But I have the very unusual experience, certainly unusual these days, it seems, as having been at the same organization now for 18 years. I do dye my grays, yes. But <laughs> what I want to share with you today is how much it means to me to be able to kick off this incredible time together and this incredible conversation. Taproot itself is now 20 years old, 20 years of impact, 20 years of being able to bring folks together around the shared idea that greater good can be achieved in the world when we are working to support the organizations, the leaders, and the communities that are doing the work out there on the front lines of driving positive social change. And at our last in-person Pro Bono Summit, which is the Global Pro Bono Summit, actually here in New York in 2019, one of the last remarks I remember making as we were wrapping up the session was how incredibly powerful it was to look around the room and have folks from across sectors, and in that summit, actually from across the globe as well, be a part of this conversation, be a part of this work and this dialogue, but wanting to also make note as we look ahead that when we bring folks together that are already a part of this dialogue, we can inadvertently end up talking to ourselves, right, in a bit of an echo chamber. And what we want to do, and what is so core to part of Taproot's mission and our DNA as well, is to focus on the ecosystem, right? Being able to make sure that we together, the broader we, are helping to advance the dialogue, advance the discussion, and advance the work, most importantly, around being able to drive that positive social change by helping the organizations and leaders making that happen. And one core way that's critical as an ingredient to go from that echo chamber to that broader ecosystem is about access, is making sure that these conversations aren't just restricted to folks already engaging in the work or in one market or in one industry and in one sector. And one of many core pieces of that that has been a part of our Pro Bono Summit since day one is making sure that attending this event virtually, in person, in any capacity can be open to all. So as you hopefully noticed, as you were registering for this event, we have always been able to count on the generous support of sponsors to underwrite your ability to attend. Not a single pro bono summit attendee ever has needed to pay for a ticket in order to participate in this conversation. And this year is no exception. And I do want to extend a tremendous thank you to our leadership sponsor, 3M, to our champion sponsors, Johnson & Johnson and Prudential, to our advocate level sponsor, Comcast NBC Universal, and to AIG for being our venue and technology sponsor and making sure that I could now welcome the people that are physically in the room with me here today and the 600 plus people that are registered to be joining us online. And that is a really big part of what also brings us here today, right? The fact that we are not just going back to <clears throat> business as usual, whatever that even could possibly mean everywhere. This really is business unusual. This is us leaning into and acknowledging together everything we did have the chance to already learn over the last two and a half years, let alone the last 20 years of our work, and identify the pieces that are a core part of moving us forward together now. So that means being able to bring some folks together in person while also having this conversation engaged in by 600 plus other people. Oh, and Siri, apparently. I'll turn Siri off now. <laughs> Thanks for listening, Apple. Being able to make sure that these conversations are happening across sectors with folks who are just getting started in this journey, folks who are leaders in this, folks who are willing to open up their minds, their hearts, their notebooks, and share candid insights about what they've had the chance to learn, what they've participated in, and what hopefully you can take some insights away from as well. And with that, I'll give a little plug, which is our final session tomorrow is going to be an Ask a Root session. 
And for those of you who are very familiar with Taproot, you know that we call our employees our roots. So tomorrow is a special opportunity to be able to dig in a little deeper with some other roots from across the Taproot Foundation in order to get in there and ask some of your burning questions from the 20 years and $280 million worth of pro bono service that's been able to come just through Taproot's own programming, let alone the incredible programming of other partners and parties in the field. What have we had the chance to learn? What can help you as you think about your own journey in pro bono? So as you're taking your notes, make some notes for what you wanna ask a route tomorrow, whether you're in person or whether you're online. Bear in mind that we have a tremendous number of folks who are joining us in this conversation. And I don't wanna overstate it, but I think you're gonna be pretty blown away by how impressive AIG's technology is. So another nod and thank you to AIG, where folks who are in the room and folks who are online are gonna be able to see and interact with our speakers all together, which also means having folks in the chat able to submit questions in addition to having questions from folks in the room. So one thing I would normally love to do at a moment like this is to actually go around and start introducing ourselves to each other so you know who's here, where you're coming from geographically, but also professionally, where do you work? What sector, how do you interact with this work? It's a little tricky to do with 600 some people and some folks in the room and some online, but I have faith that the folks who are coming together around this will be able to identify ways that we can connect with each other. So here's what I'm gonna do. For folks in the chat, I want you to start saying hello. Go ahead and say where you're dialing in from, where you're joining us from. And for folks in the room, and I'll repeat back what you say so our folks in line can hear you as well. I wanna take a little poll to see who has made the farthest trip to get here today in person. A little birdie told me that there was a little road trip involved. Someone in the room, did someone drive more than five hours to join us here today? <laughs> wow. Can we introduce you? I'm sorry, what's that? Will you introduce yourself? Uh, sure, should I stand or? Yeah, go right ahead. And I, I'm gonna repeat it from my strong mics for our folks on. Um, hi, my name is Kevin Mulhall. I'm a technical customer success manager with TechSoup. Um, for those of you who don't know um, who TechSoup is, we are a distributor of hardware, software, networking, uh, and managed solutions for other nonprofits, uh, both in the United States as well as globally with our partners. So seven hours, 48 minutes. <laughs> That's so fine. 48 minute drive, rest stops hopefully included. Three hours, had to take two meetings. Okay, two <laughs> meetings on the way. Pulled over for safety. We, yeah, we weren't zooming. Oh, okay. Coffee shop. Coffee <laughs> shop, there we go. Just letting the world know this. Thank you for making that trek to be with us here today. And in addition to our colleagues from AIG, I think the record for shortest trip, besides getting to your desk and logging in, might be our colleagues from Comcast, NBC Universal, a whopping, Seven seconds. Seven seconds. <laughs> Not elevator time. Okay, Can I call upon one of you just to quickly introduce yourselves? <laughs> uh, sure, Jessica Clancy. I uh, have the pleasure of speaking a little bit later today, but um, I'm VP of CSR at NBC Universal, Dirty Rock, and joined by my colleagues Robert Charles and Sam Camerata. We have the opportunity to work with the Tapro team, the Pixera team, and others in the pro bono ecosystem to think about what does pro bono look like at, at NBC. So for folks online, and now you can see a little bit of the transcription with our microphones picking things up there, but we have our colleagues from Comcast, NBC Universal. You'll be getting to know Jessica Clancy a bit later when I had the chance to introduce her even more in depth as part of our session. They had a whopping seven second commute from 30 Rock across the way. Um, and I know we have hundreds of folks online. I know folks are starting to say some hellos in the chat and we'll hear a little voiceover in the room as well as present when we do have time for Q&A. That way we can hear from each other as we're engaging in this work. So what we have coming up ahead of us today is an incredible start to the day. I wanna take you back a little bit with me now to October of 2019, back when we thought nothing was going to change about the way we came together with events. I had the, the pleasure of being able to attend an event put on by the Better Business Bureau here in New York. And a core part of that session was digging into some critical data, identifying some of the core challenges that face our leaders in the nonprofit sector who have historically been marginalized from accessing resources. And I want to segue through that to an introduction to our first session. But first I wanna tell you a little bit about where we have been 
as a field and then Taproot Foundation in particular. When we were founded 20 years ago, it was largely with the focus on trying to change and look, it was the early 2000s, so disrupt as everyone said then, the inequities between the sectors in accessing resources. And that was a core focus of the idea of this model coming into life. How can we ensure that nonprofit organizations are able to access the same kinds of resources that any kind of business or institution needs to thrive in achieving its mission? Now we've had the opportunity to shift towards identifying and bringing this work and these resources to be a part of counteracting and counterbalancing the inequities and in accessing resources within the sector. And one of the pieces of data and one core report that I found to be so meaningful and was struck by in October of 2019 at this Better Business Bureau event was the data being put out by the Race to Lead movement with the Building Movements Project. And I'm going to have the chance actually right now, wow, 1.30 on the nose Eastern, perfect timing, to be able to introduce Francis Kuhnreuter. Francis is the co-director of the Building Movements Project, the tremendous group I just began referencing that's done incredible research and data um, in a number of reports you're gonna have the chance to explicitly learn about now called Race to Lead. One of the things that I think is so incredible and so striking about what she'll have the chance to walk you through today is the direct personal lived experience feedback from leaders in our sector. And I want to plant the seeds with you now as we look ahead, thinking about the next 20 years of our impact, thinking about the next 20 days of what you'll be thinking about and planning your own programming and work. What can you take away from the conversation you're about to be a part of, from the data you're about to have the chance to learn about, from the lived experiences it represents, which might be your own or might be that of others in your community, your organization, um, and field? and take that with you as we go through all of the subsequent sessions as a part of this pro bono summit and be a part of that change with us. Be a part of this business unusual as we're looking not to go back to the way things were, but to push ahead to the way things can be as we all come together around this core purpose of driving social change by supporting these organizations. So with that, I am going to bring up onto our screen, Francis Kuhnreuter. Francis, so delighted to have you joining us here today. I'm gonna to step away from my big mic now and hand the virtual and true mic over to you. Thanks so much, uh, Lindsay, and what a lovely introduction. I'm thrilled to be here today and to talk to you. And as Lindsay said, a lot has happened since that presentation in 2019. Uh, and I'm going to, let's see, let's see if I can advance this. Hmm. I'm going to stop share and I'm going to share again because things don't seem to be moving. Let's try this again. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. And we'll start from slide. Okay, there you go. That's a picture of me. I use she, she her pronouns. And now I'm co-executive director of the Building Movement Project with my colleague, Sean Thomas Breitfeld. And um, I am going to talk about Building Movement Project works to help nonprofits integrate and act on social change and social justice values uh, in their work. And one part of that work is what we call our race to lead work. And that really began, wow, a long time ago in 2014 and 2015, we were doing work on generational shifts in leadership. We actually wrote a book on general sh uh, generational shifts in leadership. And we were saying that leaders of the nonprofit sector were going to look different and act different than the current leadership of my generation of the boomer generation. Uh, and then we started looking around and noticing that uh, though there were leadership changes happening, that there were really very few leaders of color in the nonprofit sector. And so we started with this question, which is why, uh, despite the increased number of, at that time, training programs uh, for developing leaders of color, the number of groups working on race and race equity, were there not more leaders of color in the nonprofit sector? Uh, there was lots of different data, not really very good data to tell you the truth, but most of the data said that under 20% and some of it under 10% of nonprofit leaders were people of color. So we were, why, why is that? Why aren't things changing? 
And so uh, you're gonna hear from me talking about uh, a series of reports. Just, I'm, I'm gonna give you the, the highlights and then you can go to the website, our buildingmovement.org uh, website or the race to lead uh, org satellite website if you wanna learn more. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the uh, two national surveys, the race to lead that was done in, uh, the survey was done in 2016, the data came out in 2017. Uh, the race to lead revisited another survey three years later in 2019 and data from that. Uh, and then two um, more recent reports that came out in 2020 this year, uh, really focusing in on executive director CEOs of nonprofits. So, uh, and as I said, we were, you know, 2014, 2015, we were like, why isn't something happening? We said, okay, let's do a survey. And we put a survey out in the field and over 4,300 uh, people working for pay in the nonprofit sector responded to that survey. We redid that survey in 2019. This is a heat map of where people came from, all 50 states, and uh, we had uh, about a thousand more respondents. Um, we were especially interested in comparing people of color and white respondents and did a lot of outreach in uh, BIPOC uh, communities, uh, in um, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities, and you can see here the blue bars you'll always notice are um, people of color respondents So that umber color bar, those are white respondents. Of the people of color, the most likely respondents are the, with the highest percentage are Black, African American, followed by Latinx, Hispanic, and then about an equal number of Asian American and multiracial in both the 2016 and the 2019 survey. So first I'm gonna uh, concentrate on this first two surveys, kind of like what the original findings were, both of them, and then switching over to what we learned in 2019 that was, wasn't published when Lindsay saw that presentation because it came out in 2020, something what we call the white advantage in the nonprofit sector and a little bit of data on, on DEI. We didn't have a lot, but, uh, and again, just giving you some highlights. So um, when we say that the first finding is the same story, it's that in the first race to lead survey, we found that people of color and white respondents were almost exactly uh, qualified, had the almost exact same qualifications to become leaders. A similar educational attainment, um, almost exact on training. We asked a million different training questions and the people of color were actually more motivated to be leaders. And that the barriers to advancement weren't that people of color didn't have enough training uh, or that they didn't have the same educational attainment is that they were facing uh, systemic biases, racial biases. And so this gives you uh, uh, the data from 2016 and 2019 to a question that we asked only of people who were not already CEOs and executive directors. They were left out. The rest of the respondents were asked, Do you, um, would you like to become an executive director or the head of a nonprofit in the future? <laughs> And this is that uh, oval circle to your left is the definitely probably less. And you can see even in 2016, um, people of color aspired to be leaders, 10 percentage points more than white respondents. And that grew to 15 percentage points because of a few more leaders of color, a few percentage points more said they wanted to be leaders and less uh, white people said they were interested in nonprofit leadership, kind of an interesting change there. Um, we asked a lot of questions about what impacted their career advancement. We asked about their educational attainment, um, very similar responses from people of color and white respondents about their track record of work. Again, very similar uh, percentages. And then we asked the impact on race and career advancement. And, and you'll see the top bars here, 2016, the bottom bars are 2019. Uh, and what really struck us it, in 2016, we were already struck that over a third of uh, the people of color responded that their race had negatively impacted their career advancement. Um, and that uh, increased to almost a half in 2019. And conversely, uh, for white leaders, 50% uh, said that their career advancement had uh, was, hinder, was enhanced by their race, uh, was aided by uh, their race. And uh, that increased to over two thirds in 2016. So this is a quote from uh, one of the respondents. We had thousands of thousands of write-ins in both uh, of the race to lead uh, uh, surveys. Um, this is somebody who says it's challenging constantly being the only Latina in all white and mostly male circles. It's a constant challenge knowing when to be strategic to stand up for my community and when I need to hold back or else be left out of decision-making circles and labeled as the angry Latina. Um, this data, we asked 
people a lot in both of those surveys about their challenges and frustrations. And you can see people uh, are equally challenged by their workload in the nonprofit sector. Um, then you get this a uh, uh, little bit of a difference between people of color and white respondents, especially the differences are enhanced uh, in 2019 and that feeling they had inadequate salaries, few opportunities of, for advancement. But we really wanted to point out this lack of role models. Role models are so important to advancing into leadership positions. And between 2016 and 2019, more people of color said they didn't have role models or they were challenged by the lack of role models and fewer white people had similar challenges. That was a 19 percentage point difference. So something that we were really struck by. Uh, this is a, another write-in. I've had phenomenal support, mentorship and sponsorship by women of color, mostly black women like myself, who have provided me the emotional support critical to enduring and persisting through microaggressions. I would not have been able to persist without them. Um, so that's kind of a snapshot of the first set of findings. Again, more if you look at the report. Uh, I wanted to then talk about what we call the white advantage and that white people in the sector uh, have an advantage over people of color in terms of the organizations they work in and how they feel about those organizations. So let me uh, tell you what I mean by that. In the 2019 survey, we asked people just the percent of people of color on their board, uh, in their top leadership, for the rest of the staff that aren't in top leadership, and in the constituency and communities they serve. And you can see the response rates here that um, for the board, uh, over half the group said that less than 25% of the people on the board were people of color. And that was a, a very similar percentage for people in top leadership. And then you can see this kind of dramatic change of almost a little bit of an equaling out uh, on the staff. And then the opposite effect, that stepped opposite effect in terms of the communities that people serve. So we thought about that and we thought about this quote of a black survey respondent who said, I'm usually the only one, uh, only or one of a handful of BIPOC, talk. and as I said, that's black indigenous and people of color in the room. It's such an isolating, frustrating and infuriating dynamic. The lack of leadership of color at every organization I've worked at has impacted not only the running of the organization, but my own professional development, even personal development. So what we did is we said, well, what, what organizations are what we call white run? What organizations have more than 75% of both their board members and their top leadership that are white? And that's that orange color there. And then we said, and what about organizations led by people of color. Well, we looked at 50% or more, not a lower threshold of organizations where people of color, uh, there were more than 50% uh, of people of color on both the board and in the top leadership. And you can see really if it was evenly distributed what it looked like, that gray color is all the other groups that have every other combination in between. Um, and yet most people worked in uh, white, run organizations where 40, uh, that was 45%, where 75% or more of the board and top leadership are white. Then came closely followed by every other combination except for the people of color led, which was only 14% of the total sample. So um, we were curious about the impact this had on how people felt about their workplace. These questions that we asked are very common. I, you might have taken them yourselves. They're called not, net promoter questions. They're asked to see how people feel about uh, their workplace. Uh, and you can see across the top, I would be happy if I worked at this organization three years from now. I feel like I have a voice in my organization. Uh, my organization offers fair and equitable opportunities for advancement and promotion. And you see that blue dot is the um, average rate of uh, people of color respondents and that umber color dot is the average rate of um, how positive people are uh, about their uh, in their response rates. So um, uh, 10 is I'm very positive and zero is uh, uh, totally negative. And you can see in white run organizations, just white people are having a better experience in those organizations in all three of these categories, especially when you compare them to the people of color. Um, these are very wide differences um, in, um, in statistical terms. That distance uh, lessens a little bit when you look at all those other groups in between. And then uh, in those, uh, the groups that were uh, people of color run, you can see that 
um, it actually, the, not only does the difference disappear, but in fact, everybody seems to be happier or doing better in those organizations, feel better about the organization. Um, so that's what we mean by a white advantage. White people do better in white run organizations, uh, which are most of the organizations that people work in. Uh, and the last thing about these two big national surveys that I wanted to mention were the uh, DEI initiatives um, uh, that we asked for the first time here. And um, almost three quarters, 74% of respondents said there was some sort of DEI initiative in their organization. And uh, this gives you a sense of what uh, those DEI initiatives were, the training of staff, very common, um, clarifying how DEI is central to the mission, uh, looking at how race equity and bias impacts the work, and, um, and then putting more people of color on, on the board or advisory boards. Uh, we then started thinking about, well, what makes for a good experience? And this slide is a little complicated. On the left, you just get the training topics that people had, but we thought, what if we really dug in and said, you really have a lot of training. Would you feel differently about the impact on your organization than if you just had a few trainings? So the gray uh, circle is the total positive impact. That's uh, I, some positive impact and very positive impact. So really the trainings are positive to most people, most respondents who participated in them. But what we found is that if you participated in four more trainings in your organization, in other words, your organization was really digging into the issues of racial equity, uh, you were much more likely to have a very positive impact than if you just had one, two, or three trainings. So the, the more the groups really address the issue, the more they dug into each other, the more positively respondents felt about the trainings and their impact on the organization. This is uh, one of the write-ins again. I have been fortunate that my organization was provided funding for equity training. The trainers helped the group identify many of the structural and systemic inequities in our organization's structure and culture. To have been part of this transformation, it takes love, patience, diplomacy, anger, and dogged persistence. So we have several recommendations that we did in the, that these are from the um, 2019 report. I'll just touch on a couple of them that we just need to pay attention to the experience of people of color in the workplace. Of course, we wanna ensure that the policies uh, and procedures in that workplace uh, are consistent with racial equity goals, but we also need to know how they impact the people working in the organization. Uh, you need to set those goals, racial equity goals, and be transparent about how you're doing uh, on them to the whole organization. Are you meeting the goals or not? So I want to pivot from here because um, as we were seeing some changes in 2019, 2020, uh, especially Sean, my co-executive director, what were, he was talking to other executive directors of color and he was noticing that especially people who are uh, directors who were taking over from CEOs that were taking over from white leaders were having particularly difficult experiences. So uh, we put out two reports last year trying to dig into why that was. Um, and so I'm going to report on both of them. The first one is called Making or Taking Space, which we did with the Robert Sterling Clark Foundation. And we looked at nine organizations in their orbit that had gone from a white executive director to an executive director of color, uh, to a BIPOC executive director. And uh, we interviewed, the interviews were of the exiting leader, the exiting white leader, the incoming leader of color. Sometimes they were leaders, a couple of times they were co-executive directors. And then uh, we interviewed a board member that had been involved in that transition. And so what I want to do is give you some of the findings uh, from that uh, there are four findings, and I'm going to go through them very quickly. What was interesting right away as we analyzed these transcripts, uh, looking at what people said, kind of going over and over again, the interviews, that most of the white uh, leaders, I think uh, seven out of nine, uh, at, or it might have been their board, it might have not have been the leader, were really intentionally recruiting a leader of color to come in, and that this coincided with internal issues that were happening in the organization um, that related to race or racism in the organization. So there was al already some racial strife in the organization. So leaders of color were coming into organizations that were already experiencing this sort of racial strife. This is a board member uh, 
a comment in uh, this board member's interview that said there was a massive st staff transition that occurred. Four women of color left the staff within three much, months. I think partly that contributed to why this transition happened. It felt like a surprise to the board that all of these staff members were leaving and were very deeply unhappy and decided they were leaving because of power dynamics, racial dynamics. Um, the other three findings really uh, are along the same lines that the entering BIPOC leaders, the entering leaders of color, almost in every case were ex familiar with the organization and they understood that they were being brought in not only to run the organization and to uh, continue to grow and make sure the organization thrived, but also to kind of address these internal uh, uh, issues, um, especially with the staff. But the extent of the issues were not always clear. Uh, the leaders of color were also prepared to do this, whether it was um, sometimes the, it, the expectation was made explicit, but sometimes it was implicit. They knew what was going on, but nobody really said that was what was going on, why they were hiring a leader of color. Uh, so they had double duty. They had to both run the organization and address internal equity issues. But then they faced other challenges that were unexpected, especially related to funding, where it looked like from the financials that everything was fine, but then they found out certain things were restricted or uh, uh, money wasn't available to them that they thought was available. Uh, so that really hindered their, um, their ability to move the organization forward, though all of them have actually, um, looking back now. And then the last thing I wanted to say is that um, several of the leaders noticed that they that what was an additional responsibility they had is that they had to protect or support the exiting leader, even if they were kind of cleaning up some of the problems that had been created. Now, I just want to say, having taken over from an executive director, having been twice an executive director, that everybody who leaves leaves a dirty closet. I mean, nobody uh, fixes everything in the organization before you leave. There's always things you don't get to. There are always problems, but these were really exacerbated by the issues of the racial dynamics. This is a quote from an incoming leader of color who says, it's just absurd. I feel like funders are so excited to have a moment of hiring a leader of color and be like, yay, look what's happening. And everybody's like, yay. And then they just walk away. And in most cases that I know of, the staff has deep, seated issues of race and gender and gender identity that nobody has dealt with or impact. You step into that role and people are like, I want this solved tomorrow. We don't have the liberty as black women leaders to say, we're gonna set that aside and come back to it a month. Our staff will revolt. So that's the, the qualitative study that we did or uh, report that we did. Um, on these transitions. And then we did a more quantitative analysis. And this was actually from the 2019 uh, race to lead data where we had over 900 executive directors respond to that survey. Uh, so we did some analysis of that. And I'm just gonna, because of time and I wanna leave some time for questions, I just am gonna go over uh, a couple of uh, the findings there. I'm gonna go over three in particular, but you can see all uh, five of them here. Um, and especially I'll just point out that um, I just referenced that leaders of color take on additional burdens without the additional compensation, that these leaders who are coming in to solve internal problems and to lead the organization and to grow the organization aren't compensated uh, for that extra labor. Um, so let me go to the first finding that leaders of color need supports, uh, but they don't need more training. This really echoes what I said in the very first finding we had when those two national studies that people are qualified uh, to lead, but, um, but that they do need support in their leadership roles. This is a person who, um, a survey respondent who said uh, she had hit the glass ceiling several times before she became CEO. I found myself being passed up for roles less experienced, while less experienced white women are male, leaders of color ascended into promotions. I grew weary of having to constantly advocate for myself while others had institutional sponsors lobbying on their behalf. The reason that's highlighted is, uh, I just wanted to show you this one chart, this one figure that shows how people of color CEOs, these are only CEOs or executive directors of nonprofits, um, were less likely to have mentors at their job. And we all know how important it is to advance. Uh, to have mentors at your work site. Uh, there were equal, pretty equal numbers of uh, percentages of mentors outside the job. Most people had that. 
Uh, at, but what was interesting to us is that people of color CEOs were more likely to have coaches or executive coaching. And we uh, surmise that that's because uh, they haven't had this mentorship at work. So they're bringing in the type of support that they need. They need that support. Um, unfortunately, they also have to pay for that support where mentors at work, you're not, you're not paying for that. We also found that's not shown here is that uh, people of color were less likely to be in uh, peer support networks than white respondents. Um, so the second uh, finding uh, that I wanted to highlight was finding number four, which there were these unique challenges that come uh, with taking over from a white predecessor. I'm just highlighting uh, in a different way uh, some of what I just um, explained to you with a qualitative report, with a making or taking space report. Uh, this is a chart of who uh, somebody's predecessor was. We asked the CEOs, was your predecessor white? Uh, was your predecessor a person of color or did you or are you the founder where you have no predecessor and you can see that for people of color which is that top uh, line um, almost half were taking over from uh, a leader of color whereas 81 percent of white people were following white people only eight percent of whites were taking over from a leader of color uh, so 46 percent of leaders of color were taking over from a white predecessor and so what I want you to pay attention to in this a little bit complicated uh, figure is that blue bar in the middle, that blue bar. Um, so those are the uh, leaders uh, on the left side are the EDs and CEO of color. On the right side are white EDs and CEOs um, who took over from a white leader. And you can see that uh, people of color who take over from a white leader are less likely to have support from their staff uh, and they're less likely to say their staff accepts them holding um, them accountable uh, for the work. And actually what's not shown here is we asked, actually asked about trust from the board and people of color who uh, follow white leaders have a 10 percentage point less trust from the board than either white leaders or people of color who take over from uh, other people of color. And then the last finding of these reports I want to emphasize is that the too few white leaders really factor race equity into their succession plans. About a half of the um, executive directors that uh, took the survey say they were either actually in the process of planning to leave or they were starting to think about how they were going to leave their organization. So we asked them th these questions like, what are you thinking about in terms of your successor? Were you actively mentoring a staff of color, uh, whether you... Uh, we're um, making networks with communities of color for succession or connecting with other leaders of color. And you can see that white leaders really fall short uh, compared to leaders of color and really doing this sort of outreach so that they are succeeded by a person of color. Uh, this is uh, from a white executive director's focus group that I did in Boston. Um, and uh, this is a white executive director who said, uh, there's two parts to winning. He's, he was talking about having a a person of color take over in an executive transition. He said, there's getting your colleague of color into that position. That's the first part. And the hardest thing is to make sure that she has the support to succeed. So uh, before I end, I just wanna say, we're in the process of collecting uh, uh, our data for the 2022 Race to Lead Survey. It's out in the field. I'm gonna give you a QR code soon. So I hope you'll send it to somebody who works in the nonprofit sector, who works for pay in the nonprofit sector to take the survey or tweet it or do ever, anything you want with it. But I thought I'd give you a little preview of the first 2000 respondents. Uh, first of all, this is that, that first chart you saw, whether um, uh, you're aspired to be a nonprofit leader, these are just a definitely yes, but look at that, that you still see that uh, percentage point difference, that 12 percentage point difference over in 2022 for these first 2000 respondents. Uh, but what you don't, um, what, what we are really noticing is fewer people want to be leaders, a concern to us, uh, uh, thinking about do people want these leadership roles at this time. The other thing we did is we asked uh, people, we're asking people about their experience kind of post uh, 20, March 2020, post uh, the onset of uh, the COVID pa pandemic, the uprisings, et cetera. And um, we asked just how important these things are, uh, if they're more important or equally important or less important. Uh, and uh, as you see, this flexible hours and uh, working arrangements just hit, hit, went off the charts on what that being so much more important to respondents. Uh, but other things were important as well. So this is the QR code, take a picture of it.
send it to somebody, take the survey. We really need more respondents. We're experiencing what happens when there's survey fatigue. Uh, and if you want to be in touch, uh, this is my email, fconoiderbuildingmovement.org. Please go to the website. And I think that is it. I'm going to stop my share and uh, see if there are any questions. Francis, thank you. And I'm just getting over to the big mic here. And uh, because I'm sharing, I didn't see if there was anything in the chat. So I'll let somebody else tell me if there was. Thank you. We, we do have time for one or two live questions. If anyone either in the chat or in the room does want to pose a question to Francis. And then I'll also just add that those incredibly helpful slides and that data is available on the Excel events platform and will make available as well. If you want to dig in a bit more to be able to follow up and share that QR code or share the survey through the QR code as well. But I'll pause for a moment to see, are there any questions that we should use some time for now? Yeah, Kevin. Uh, so my question would be that- And I'll repeat it back to you, Francis, so you can hear. Great. What, what then maybe from these findings is structurally, like what, what are next steps? Because this is obviously very impactful, but how is this gonna get translated into actual meaningful change? So I, I know you probably have a lot of thoughts on this, Francis, but even just one or two initial thoughts with such impactful data and insights, what are one or two examples that come to mind for you about translating this into actionable or meaningful change? Well, the first thing is, is that what we found in the beginning is when we, people would talk about racial equity, they do a lot of talk and there was very little action. Um, in other words, people, act, we, were, we would sometimes laugh because, you know, the term white supremacy culture or white supremacy would roll off of people's tongues, but nothing really changed internally in organizations. And so the first thing that I just wanna say is that change actually means change. Um, and really looking at your organization and looking at the power dynamics of the experience of people of color in that organization, uh, looking at your uh, equity in every level of pay equity and positional equity, and really addressing what is unfair. These are these, we know we live in a larger context of structural inequity, but there's so much we can do within our organizations that we don't do. And talking and training is great. It's a start, but not followed by action of really thinking about how you can change within your organization, how you can have difficult conversations. Uh, actually, we just developed, if anybody's interested, please reach out to me, a um, automated algorithmically generated uh, race equity assessment for organizations that really is based on four building blocks. It's a, you've got a very detailed, customized uh, narrative and visual report, uh, very long. Um, but the four building blocks really to change are, um, are really having a, a leadership commitment to uh, being a learning organization and really being committed to learn and to enact learning, uh, to look at who has voice and power in the organization, and then to be able to have difficult conversations. And those are really the elements of culture change, but also changing in racial equity. Thank you for that, Francis. And before I uh, pose a question myself, I wanna leave space in case there's any additional questions for online. It looks like that. We, we do have one speaker uh, who would like to come off mute and ask a question. Uh, Dr. Tatum, if you can unmute and ask your question, please. Hey, guys, this is Dr. Kathy Tatum of Collaborating Voices here in Houston, Texas. I am the founder. It's a question in a statement. I'm also an activist and I speak to um, our cities and our, our government. And one of the questions that I always ask them is, do you even know that the company Companies that you give the money to in the grants, do they diversify? And are they giving it to MOUs? I, you know, I'm gonna give you an example. I do domestic violence, and a lot of these cities get their money from, you know, DC and major, but I don't think they actually use this data. So I know when you give this data to me, I'm gonna go back. We have a lot of people that are in power here in Houston, Texas that are black and brown, but even they don't give it to is disparities. And a lot of companies are getting away with putting black and brown on brochures, on the commercial. And when I talk to the liaisons, they're more often get paid maybe 400 or not at all. 
So all these companies are getting grants saying they are diversified and they come in there and then I and I bring it to them and I go, hey, I was at your golf tournament and I could pick out one or two black people at your golf tournament for your fundraiser. Or here goes the gala and a lot of the black and brown people that are on boards or working for these nonprofits, they can't even afford to go to the gala. So one of my questions is, why aren't we surveying government Actually, the ones that actually give out the grants, why ain't they doing these surveys? Like, do they even know the diversify of the MOUs? Because if they really looked at it, and one of the other question is, why don't we have a survey on how much money actually goes out to the black and brown? If $10 million comes in for a diversified community, a lot of the white nonprofits and boards are bringing, or not just boards, but workers, are bringing in millions as a director versus a black and brown nonprofit that are working out of their home, working out of their garage. And if we actually ask for money, we are literally said that we don't want to work with you. But white boards and white nonprofits, they could bring in $4 million and nobody blinks. So that's, I, I hope that uh, brings that to attention of things that we, I would love to have where I could push that out even more. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tatum, I really appreciate what you raised because all of it is so true. There is a program that Race Forward does that really works with government and training government. Uh, it's called GARE. It's like a government something for racial equity, but I forget the uh, middle name, but uh, everything you raise is true. What One of the things that happened when we were doing white focus groups is I can remember uh, suddenly a light bulb went off in my head and I uh, met with my co-executive director, Sean, and I said, I'm really worried. And he, uh, from what I'm hearing in the white focus groups with executive directors, and he said, why? And I said, because these are all white dominant groups that say, well, we need even more money because we want to diversify. So you have to give us more money. And uh, the groups led by uh, people of color are still not getting the money they need and deserve. So I think all of these issues, these are uh, what, what um, that uh, Dr. Tatum is pointing out is these are structural issues. They can be solved, but we have to look beyond the images, the words, uh, and the, um, and the, uh, the language to really look at has there been changes? That's why I said, you know, uh, audits on pay equity, how, how many grants go to people of color led organizations and what amounts. So you could give a lot more grants, but give very small grants. Uh, so all of this is, I think, I, I just, everything you raised, I wanna echo and really appreciate you raising all those questions. Thank you so much. And Francis, thank you again for bringing this data along with your co-executive director and all of your colleagues to the forefront. Thank you to everyone today who I know will take this data, bring it with you into your work, into your communities. Given that this is the Pro Bono Summit, one of the many, many ways I think this can be incredibly valuable as we continue through the discussions today is thinking about these compounding factors that organizations that are a part of being uh, in these pro bono programs are also facing going through. Thinking about the design choices if you're a practitioner that might implicitly or explicitly affect who even gets access to these incredibly valuable services. And look ahead now and think about the ways that sharing the link to this survey and other aspects of that can ensure that data like this can continue to be brought to the forefront and incorporated into the dialogue and the way we think about program design and ultimately action and change, as you put so well, Francis. So thank you again so much. As a reminder for everyone, you'll be able to access these slides on Excel events and on the Tappert Foundation website as well. And looking forward to sharing the link to the updated survey so that we can make sure that more of this data is brought to the table. Thank, thank you, you again. Thank you so much. Francis. Have a great uh, conference. And for our attendees, as we continue on through our agenda today, we do have a brief break now. We'll be coming back together at 2.15 Eastern, so not all that long from now. Please take a moment, jot down your notes, take a break, and come on back 2.15 Eastern. See you right here very soon. We have to go.